Welcome to our little oasis. I'm in Azerbaijan in my grandparents' country house. They have had this place since I was born and they've kept it so beautifully. It is full of greenery, it's full of plants, um, trees like fruit trees that you can pick. They grow pomegranates, olives, um, watermelons, grapes, apricots, apples, pears, potatoes, onions, herbs, like you name it, they grow it. It's absolutely beautiful. I love, love coming here. And I've been coming here since I was a child. As an adult, especially an adult who has only lived in cities, I've come to appreciate this place so much. It truly is an amazing escape away from the rushing and the bustle of the city. I feel like I get so inspired by all the beautiful nature. And one thing that really strikes me about it that's different to the way cities are is it's pretty unkempt, like it's not uniform, you know, things just kind of grow everywhere. There's not really any like rhyme or reason to it. And I feel like we've really lost that. Like, I feel like humanity has really lost the beauty of like being wild, being untamed. And I read an article the other day about the sameness that globalization and capitalism has brought to like our cities, our design, the way that products are designed, the way that apps are designed. It's just there's such a sameness to humanity right now, but I don't feel it's in our nature. I think this sort of unkemptness is much more creative, much more beautiful, and much more inspiring. And that brings me quite nicely onto what I want to talk about today. For the last few years, I've been on a journey of unlearning capitalism, internalized capitalism, and partly I've done that through therapy, and I think therapy is a really powerful tool to unlearn like unhealthy habits and conditioned habits. I feel like there are certain messages that capitalism teaches us about who we should be and how we should be. And it instills messages of perfectionism that I think are just not in line with how human beings are. Like we are life forms on a planet that, as far as we know, is the only planet that sustains life. But we live in a system that is predicated on endless growth. It doesn't make sense. I mean, we live on a finite planet that is governed by the laws of nature, and yet we live by a system that completely ignores the laws of nature. So we think of ourselves now, human beings, as separate to nature. You know, even the way we talk about nature, the language we use about nature, it's always something other than us. It's like we are observers. Oh, nature is so beautiful, nature is so this, but it's like we are actually part of that. We are constantly in exchange with nature. Every time we breathe, we are exchanging particles, oxygen particles, with the trees, the algae that give us this ability to breathe the food we eat, the water we drink. There are so many life forms involved in all of that. And without those life forms, we can't survive. But we live in a system that ignores all of that and just puts emphasis on profit. So we've now, I think, psychologically like internalized some of that. And it's pretty harmful. And I think there are a lot of mental health conditions that come from that. For myself, I had pretty bad anxiety. That's why I sought out therapy in the first place. And, uh, you know, perfectionism. I had regular panic attacks and fear. You know, I think fear is another really important emotion for capitalism to keep going. I think you know, the, the fact that we're not taught to honor our emotions, to feel into our emotions and to use them as like compasses, 
which that's what they're for that's what emotions are for they they are like our body's internal compass the fact that we're not taught to do that is such a shame and really you know we need to now teach ourselves how to do it because the system won't So for me, one of the most important things that I learned, and I'm still learning, and I don't think I'll ever truly be done, is how to use my emotions as an opportunity to learn, to learn about myself. And, you know, a lot of that comes with awareness. You have to be aware of what's going on in your body. Like, even for me filming this video, I'm feeling a lot of self-doubt. I'm feeling some anxiety I guess over the results but that is that is also what our society has taught us we're taught that like metrics are the only thing that matters metrics 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 but actually I'll be happy if I just touch one person with this video and that's the reality like even if I just touch one other human being with this video that should be enough and that is enough I know that intuitively but I think because we live in this society that's so focused on metrics, so focused on success and results, I've internalized that and I, and I feel that rising in me right now as I'm making this video. So that is one of the most important things I think is just to be aware of your emotions and listen to what they're telling you. You know, your body is an incredible, incredible yeah work of nature i mean emotions exist for a reason they're there to keep us safe to teach us things to help us grow help us learn and there's no need to run away from them you know we can breathe and we can be aware of them and be conscious of them just ask what they're trying to teach us and I think under capitalism, emotions are not valued at all. It's all about getting rid of your emotions. Like, I think if you live under the system of capitalism, you're constantly striving for a version of yourself that is machine-like. It's like all your human qualities are not appreciated. So it's better for the system if you're more like a machine if you don't sleep if you don't have sicknesses if you don't have emotions capitalism rewards you so i think that in itself shows just how unjust and inappropriate the system is for our like biology and i think one of the reasons it's so powerful is because we've been taught that no other system can work no other system is able to rein in the worst parts of humanity self-interest is in our nature i think that's what we're taught and so when we try to imagine another system it's like oh well it's either this or communism like there's no alternative and actually that's a really pessimistic way of viewing human beings it's a very punitive way of viewing human beings that's another way to unlearn internalized capitalism is to be kind to be kind to yourself and not to punish yourself you know the system doesn't want us to do that making mistakes is part of nature nature also makes mistakes you know we are we are nature, so by virtue of being part of nature, we will make mistakes. And they're very valuable. And we shouldn't ever strive for a world where there are no mistakes, because in a world where there are no mistakes, there's no learning. So that's another way that I unlearned internalized capitalism, is just to start to be kind to myself. And honestly, it's a daily battle. Like, there are so many temptations to compare myself to other people, which is a way of not being very nice to yourself, by the way, or to berate myself for making a mistake or to avoid doing something because I'm afraid of making a mistake 
all of these things do not serve our growth, our spiritual growth, our psychological growth. I think being kind to yourself is a very impactful way to be more human under this system that doesn't want you to be human. And that includes like taking care of your physical body, feeding it nourishing things, moving, not because you want to achieve something, but simply just to move your body and give it what it needs. Like our bodies are designed to move. Um, you know, hugging yourself and, and saying affirmations, like even if you don't believe them, I think truly it's very powerful to just say certain positive things about yourself out loud and to the mirror. Moving is important, but so is resting. I think it's so important to embrace complete and utter rest. Like no physical movement, no intellectual stimulation, no emotional stimulation, just simple rest, you know, putting your phone away. Not even, even like getting a book. I think there's such an emphasis in our system on doing, constantly doing, like we're constantly expected to, to fill our time up with productive things. But nature rests, which means we must rest. We must embrace doing absolutely nothing and simply existing. Existing is enough. Like the fact that we exist is such a monumental thing. If you think about the biology of it, if you think about the chances of even just one person existing, I know we take it for granted because there's so many of us on this planet, but you know, I'm pregnant right now. I'm 15 weeks pregnant and I have millions of eggs. I was born with millions of eggs and the sequence of events that had to happen for me to be pregnant right now and for even for me to make it this far into the pregnancy, I'm not even that far, but it is not to be taken for granted. It is a, an absolute miracle. If you think about it from that perspective, you are enough. You don't need to achieve anything to be worthy of love. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to get up at 5 a.m. and work out. You don't need to buy those clothes. You don't need to move to a bigger place. You don't need anything, truly. And it took me a while to learn that. I was someone who really wanted to achieve things. I really wanted to get that validation that I was enough, you know, by achieving things. I started a business when I was 22. I started an Instagram page and, you know, some of that was motivated by validation. I wanted other people to say, wow, well done. You're so amazing. You are so successful. How do you do it? For a moment, like that felt good because I was doing so much and I was constantly filling my time with things. But underneath it was a feeling of not feeling enough as I was. And it came out in different ways and it wasn't healthy. But once I just realized that actually even if I never achieve anything ever again, even if I don't reach material success or success by our society standards, that's okay because I'm enough. But I think part of the fucked upness of this system is it's not realistic to just be con like indefinitely. It's you have to feed yourself, you have to pay rent, you have to survive in this system that needs you to do in order to survive. But I think those small acts of resistance lie in, you know, not filling up the extra time beyond the survival needs that we need to fulfill with more and more and more things that we we think we need to do in order to be successful. There are certain trends 
on TikTok about, you know, that girl getting up at 5 a.m. and working out and having a morning routine and filling your day up with a million things, which, you know, is great. If that's what you want to do, you know, that's fine. But I think it does set up an expectation that there's always more to be done. And that in itself is a capitalism. It extracts more and more and more and more from something that is finite. Your energy is finite. Your time is finite. And the more and more you extract, the more you deplete. I think we're all in this sort of state of depletion and it's really important I think for all of us to look at our lives and think about okay what can I actually whittle down like what can I have less of and maybe that's material things maybe that's what you do with your time the things that you fill your time up with I think just have a really honest look at like what you're doing to survive and like put food on the table versus what you're doing for this pursuit of more and more and more and and really like try to understand why you're doing what you're doing i think if you have that awareness and you're doing things for a certain reason you want to reach a certain goal then fine but embracing i think being is something everyone can have can do a little bit more of or not to do another thing that I have done that has really helped me is changing my mindset around scarcity I went to university and I did an economics degree so from a really young age I was taught this value that oh my god so from a really young age, I was taught this value that everything is scarce, that scarcity is just a fact of life, a fact of our economic system. And that's a lie. <laughs> it's a lie. It's a lie designed to make us think that we need to compete with each other. And some of it, you know, is misinterpreted evolutionary biology. Darwin and the survival of the fittest. I think people have misinterpreted that um, and used biological arguments. Ah! Oh my God, bro, there's so many wasps. Oh, you know what it is? They think there's flowers on the tablecloth. They think that the flowers are real flowers. Bless them. All right. I'm gonna be ready to mobilize because I've been stung one too many times by these little guys and I'm good. I'm good on that. The reason I say people are misinterpreting that is because every organism has a certain way of being in order to be successful. Humans have not been this successful by competing with each other. If I competed with the people in my tribe, 10,000 years ago, I would have not survived. I had to collaborate. And that is really the ingeniousness of human, of humanity, is our ability to cooperate with each other. That is the only reason that we have managed to gain so much power because of our ability to cooperate with each other in very large numbers. That in itself is the survival of the fittest. Only the human beings that were able to cooperate with each other were able to survive. And that's what I mean by people misinterpreting Darwin, because it's just being thought about in the wrong way. Yeah, so we have been taught to compete with each other for scarce resources, particularly money. And even love, status, advertising kind of teaches us that we need to be the first person to get this certain product because then we'll be considered cool and it works it works i think psychologically like we do fall for it because we've already been conditioned with the idea that scarcity 
is a rule, a fact of life. And that could not be further from the truth. You know, even if you think about money, the money in our system is abundant. It is. There's enough for everyone. But it doesn't seem that way because it's being hoarded. Most of the money is in the hands of very few people. And everyone else is left to fight over the scraps. You know, and that's a great way of keeping this system going. Because if you tell people things are scarce, if you tell people money is scarce, and that's what's reflected in reality, you know, for them, then you keep them in survival mode. If you keep people on the lower ends of the of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, then they're not able to think about how to self-actualize. They're not able to think about, okay, how do I, what can I do to like be the best version of myself? And if everyone was able to do that, capitalism would cease to exist. The reality is like money is, n is not abundant in our system, but I think if we all changed our mindsets around it and started to think, hey, it is abundant. It's just not in our hands right now, but you know, we can fight to get it back uh, through taxing billionaires or changing our system so that billionaires don't exist, you know, and this money is shared more equally between all of us, then we change the idea that money is scarce. It won't be scarce anymore. And I think it's really interesting seeing the dawn of AI and how AI is going to change the way that we see money. AI is going to take over jobs, it's going to automate processes that would have taken humans hours, days and whittle them down into seconds. So what's going to happen with all that extra money that AI is saving? That money is going to be abundant, so where is it going to go? And I think if we all start to think, okay, that money is there, and we all kind of deserve some of it, then we can change the poverty levels in our society and we can try to make sure that like everyone has what they need. And I think that's really key when it comes to changing your mindset from scarcity to abundance. It's not that necessarily there's more than enough for everyone. I mean, there's a lot of human beings right now but we are ingenious creatures. We can create a society, a system, where everyone does have their needs met. I think if we're able to change our mindset and really see the abundance that does exist all around us, I think that will start to undo some of the capitalist messaging that we've been taught. That brings me on to my next point, community. Community is so, so, so important to unlearn capitalism. This is something that is extremely difficult to build under capitalism. It doesn't come easily. It takes a lot of effort. It takes time. And everything that capitalism would prefer is for is for community to not exist but you know there are ways for us to cultivate community even within the confines of the system spending time with people just to spend time with people and not not having transactional relationships in our lives is a really powerful way to reject capitalism extending a hand to people in our neighborhoods that maybe we don't know talking to other people, seeing other people as equal to us and never seeing another human being or another animal as beneath us is another great way to build community. And I think this hierarchy that we live in doesn't lend itself to community. Community is about people with differences coming together and advocating for each other. So however you can try to prioritize building your community nurturing your relationships and yeah some of it starts with nurturing your relationship with yourself as well and i have a video on that as well capitalism really thrives when we feel powerless 
you know, and community does give us power. One person on our own, I mean, we're very fragile animals. There's not much that we can do that's very remarkable, like physically. But when we come together, and when you put two brains together instead of one, incredible things can happen. And, you know, nothing in our society right now is set up to maximize that. Everything is transactional. Public spaces have been completely decimated. Think of your local library. Is that a nice place that you wanna go and hang out in? Unless you live in Scandinavia, probably not. Even to sit in a coffee shop, you have to pay. And some of that, I think, puts barriers up to community. And when we see each other as competition, when we say, oh, I'll buy this piece of clothing or I'll get this car, because just to show myself that I'm better than like Mr. Smith, then that doesn't lend itself to community. There's a lot more that I could say, but I've tried to distill the most important things that I've learned into one video. I might do another video on this, but I'll leave you with the most important thing I would say. You know, all of them are important, but this is like pretty important hope hope is the antidote to capitalism capitalism relies on us not having hope that we can create something better than this destructive system that we live in the moment we give in to doomism the moment we give in to pessimism we are abiding by the rules of the capitalist system. The nature of hope is that it exists even when you don't see it in front of you, even when you don't see the evidence for hope, you still have it. You know, you could call it delusional, but you could also call it imaginative. You have to be able to imagine a better future for yourself in order to create it. And that is really the core of hope. You know, an action item for you, I think something that you can do and something that's really helped me because I've taken some courses on, you know, changing systems, changing capitalism. One of the exercises that I did was sitting down and closing my eyes 